In this lecture, we will talk about professional identity. As mental health counselors, forming a professional identity helps establish what it is that we can provide to clients. With a strong professional identity, the general perception is much greater on what it is that counselors can do. So what is a professional identity? When we use the term professional identity, we're referring to the collection of beliefs and characteristics that make up a group. This includes the philosophy, the training, and the practice characteristics of a profession. So if I were to ask you to think about a physician, what would you tell me about a physician? You probably could share with me what it is that physicians or doctors do, the types of activities they conduct with their patients, the types of training and schooling that they had to go to. For each profession, the goal is to create an identity, a brand name of sorts, that distinguishes it from other professions. For most professions, their purpose comes from research. Research that demonstrates that what they do is effective and useful. Their purpose also comes from the use of standard practices. In many instances, these standard practices form the basis of codes of ethics. In counseling, we have a code of ethics that describes what a counselor should or should not do in given situations. Further strengthening the professional identity are the training programs that we have. The goal or purpose of training programs is to serve as gatekeepers. Individuals who progress through a training program are reviewed and monitored those that meet minimum standards of practice are awarded the degree and allowed to practice in an area. Those who do not are often met with remediation plans to try to address any shortcomings they may have in their training. So with this in mind, knowing what a professional identity is, how are individuals able to achieve a professional identity? In other words, what can you as an individual counselor do to strengthen your counseling professional identity? The first thing an individual would need to do is to choose a specific profession. Before you could work on your identity, you need to choose what it is that you want to be identified as. Whether it be a doctor, lawyer, teacher, or counselor. Once you select the profession in which you hope to begin your career, you need to receive advanced training. Become trained to complete the activities required of that profession. You also should become familiar with the standards of practice that govern that profession. What is it that you can and cannot do? Once in the profession, it's also important to network and develop relationships with other colleagues and peers. You can do this by joining relevant professional organizations and networking with your colleagues, both at a local, state, and national level. And finally, our professional identity is strengthened when we continue to advance our knowledge base through continuing education, conferences, programs, and workshops, we keep strengthening our skill set, adding to it as new advances 
and new approaches are discovered. So with that as a global overview, let's talk about counseling professional identity. So what is counseling? A couple of years ago, the American Counseling Association commissioned a group known as the 2020 Committee to solicit feedback from all of the relevant counseling and counseling related organizations in the United States as to what constitutes counseling. Their goal was to establish a universal definition of counseling that could be used nationwide by all groups. The counseling organizations that were polled included ACA and its division representatives, regional counseling associations, licensing boards, accrediting agencies, Unfortunately, these groups were not able to reach consensus. A unanimous approval of a single definition of counseling was never achieved. What came to pass, that was almost a unanimous selection, is the following definition. We could look at counseling as being a professional relationship that empowers diverse individuals families, and groups to accomplish mental health, wellness, education, and career goals. Now this definition is broad and vague for a purpose. It is meant to capture all of the essential counseling and counseling related activities performed by professionals in any number of situation with any particular type of client group. To become a counselor, you must complete graduate level education of at least a master's degree, adhere to any ethical standards relevant to your practice, and you should try to seek further acknowledgement of your skills either through licensure or certification and become involved in professional organizations. In general, counselors will focus on relatively healthy functioning individuals who may be going through a temporary or transient state of difficulty. Traditionally, counseling has been thought of as a profession that helps everyday people solve everyday problems. Individuals who may not necessarily have a diagnosed impairment or mental illness, but who nonetheless are going through troubling times and could use assistance from a professional. The practice of counseling is largely holistic and focuses on treating the entire individual. What this means is that counseling and counselors realize that individuals are more than just the sum of their individual parts. Impaired functioning in one aspect of life will undoubtedly have an effect on other areas as well. An individual who is stressed or overburdened at work may bring that stress or anxiety home and it may impact family relationships with spouses or children. Counseling also follows a prevention based or developmental model of therapy. 
Rather than being reactionary, counselors try to be visionary. They try to be proactive and work on helping individuals prevent situations in the future where trouble or despair may arise. Rather than simply putting a band-aid on the problem or just treating the immediate symptoms, counselors focus on treating the root problem. In keeping with the holistic theme, counseling works at helping people create change at the behavioral, emotional, and cognitive levels. Depending on the individual, their presenting problem and their need, a counselor will work to foster change in one if not all of these areas. And finally, a point we cannot stress enough, counseling is becoming more and more empirically driven. Interventions, techniques, and approaches we use should all be data-driven and represent sound theoretical basis. In other words, we should be able to prove that what we do works. So who are counselors? According to the U.S. Department of Labor, there are over 600,000 counselors in the United States. Now this includes individuals who work in a counseling or counseling related profession in a number of different agencies from mental health to schools to medical to military, vocational rehabilitation and private practices. Clearly the scope of counseling has grown significantly in the past several decades and now counselors can be found in all walks of life and all employment settings. So how does one become a counselor? As mentioned earlier, counselors need graduate level training. The master's degree is the minimum educational level needed to practice as a counselor. Training programs are typically 48 to 60 hours in length. There are some that may be shorter and others that may be longer but the majority of programs, particularly those that produce counselors seeking licensure, will fall in the 48 to 60 hours in length. Most programs are now seeking accreditation through KCREP. KCREP is the Council for the Accreditation of Counseling and Related Educational Programs. it's a specialized accreditation. So you may have heard of universities or colleges saying that they are accredited universities. That is a more global university-wide designation. A specialized accreditation is one that is sought by a particular training program. Counselor education, for example. And the accreditation verifies that trainees in that program have met certain standards prior to their graduation. KCREP accreditation is voluntary, but it certainly is becoming more prevalent. Recent legislation by the Department of Defense and the U.S. House of Representatives has included language in bills stating that counselors who seek to be reimbursed through Medicaid and Medicare and other government payment sources need to be graduates of KCREP accredited programs. As this becomes the norm, programs will seek this accreditation out at a greater level. As of this past year, there were 262 programs that were KCREP accredited. A 
Upon graduation, individuals seeking to work as counselors will often apply for state licensure and or national certification. And we'll talk a little bit more about those later in this lecture. Aside from counselors, there are other therapeutic professionals. They may work in similar agencies and perform similar duties, but each has its own unique angle from which it approaches the therapeutic relationship. And so to help you differentiate between your profession, counseling, and these other professions, let's quickly look at what it is that they do and the focus that they take. The first we'll look at are social workers. Social workers try to help individuals, groups, and communities improve their social functioning. They rely heavily on the provision of social services, whether it's helping a person gain access to their medications, transportation, funding, housing, child care. They try to create an environment for their clients that is conducive to them leaving a healthy and productive lifestyle. As such, social workers operate from the ecological model of treatment. The ecological model posits that changing the environment or controlling the environment will help create conducive conditions for change in the individual. So the social worker believes if we could alleviate some of the basic needs of clients, it will allow them to focus more on changing what it is they need to change. Social work is one of the older mental health professions. It could trace its roots back to the 1800s, well before counseling became established as a viable profession. To qualify as a social worker, you need at least a bachelor's degree. A bachelor's of social work will allow you to begin practicing as a social worker. However, to do clinical work, a graduate degree is required. Once the graduate degree has been obtained, social workers can work towards licensure to become a licensed clinical social worker. This licensure allows them to bill for their services, work independently, and conduct any type of therapeutic treatment protocols they deem necessary for their clients. A second mental health profession are psychologists. Psychologists are interested in studying the human mind and human behavior. They adhere to the scientist practitioner model. The scientist practitioner model uses a scientific approach to identify problems, rule out alternative hypotheses or causes of those problems, and then treat the existing problem. It's based on research and scientific inquiry. Psychologists may practice in several different areas. As a psychologist, you can work in a clinical, counseling, school, industrial, organizational, or experimental research area. Psychologists are trained in APA-approved graduate training programs. The graduate degree is the minimum degree required 
to practice in the field of psychology. However, most psychologists will pursue their doctorate, for it's the doctorate that allows them to do more clinical work For a psychologist, the doctorate may be either a PhD or a PsyD. The PsyD is a doctorate specific to the counseling profession. In addition to standard coursework, psychologists must perform a clinical residency internship. These internships, which vary in length from one to two years, will require the psychologist to move to a new location, usually out of state, and work at a clinical setting, gaining valuable career experience. Once this is completed, they typically complete their degree requirements and are able to graduate. A psychiatrist is a physician who specializes in psychiatry. Psychiatry is a field of medicine, much like cardiology, pediatrics, endocrinology. They're able to treat and diagnose mental disorders and dispense medications. Psychiatrists come from a biomedical model. That means that they view mental illness as having a biological root cause. There's some type of chemical imbalance or neurological issue causing your mental illness. The current trend among psychiatrists is to use a combination of biomedical and social investigation treatment options. In addition to prescribing medications, they also try to work therapeutically to find out what conditions in the client's life may be contributing to the presence of their illness. To work as a psychiatrist, a medical degree is required either as a doctor MD or a doctor DO degree. In addition to medical school, psychiatrists complete four-year residencies in their chosen specialty area. They then are required to complete written and oral board examinations before they could begin practicing. Psychiatrists may work on staff at hospitals, they may open up their independent practice, or they may do contract work, working for many different organizations simultaneously. Often we hear the term psychotherapy used synonymously with counseling. While there are some similarities between the two, there are actually distinct types of treatment. Whereas psychotherapy is considered a more long-term medical model approach, counseling is short-term and wellness model. It operates from the belief that people are just stuck and need assistance moving in this area. Psychotherapy works on alleviating symptoms, whereas counseling looks for the root problem to try to improve the quality of your life. Psychotherapy is based on looking at the past and gaining insight into what that means, whereas counseling focuses on the here and now, realizing that we can't change the past, we can only change the future. And so the goals are change oriented. 
In psychotherapy, the therapist is the expert. Whereas in counseling, it's more of a collaboration. Counselors work cooperatively with their clients to solve issues and problems. So now that we know the difference between counseling and other professions, let's look at how we become a counselor. We've talked earlier about the three key components, education, licensure or certification, and professional involvement. Each of those are critical steps that counselors need to go through to strengthen their professional identity. Among the training programs, we talked about KCREP and its importance and its growing reputation. In addition to standardizing the training that counselors receive, it also enhances the credibility of the profession and ensures that the public is safeguarded meaning individuals who claim to be counselors will all have a similar background and skill set. As an organization, KCREP was founded in 1981. It established minimal competencies that individuals needed to practice in the counseling profession. The KCREP guidelines are divided into three different areas. A core curriculum, specialized training, and internship or field-based experiences. The core curriculum are courses that everyone takes in accredited programs, regardless of their specialty area or setting in which they hope to work. The specialized training discusses the unique skills and knowledge level needed to work in different settings. And the internship provides hands-on experience to begin practicing and demonstrating what it is learned in the classroom. Institutions going for accreditation now are following the 2009 standards. However, the 2016 standards were released late in 2012 and are out for review and feedback. Individuals or counselor educators are able to look at these standards and make comments on what they think should be kept, should be changed, or should be added in future accrediting standards. When an institution applies for accreditation, there are three decisions that could be reached. They could receive a full accreditation, which is a seven-year accreditation. They could receive a provisional accreditation, which is a two-year accreditation. Or they could be denied accreditation in which they will receive constructive feedback on which they need to change in their program. The 2009 standards represent a very significant change from the 2001 standards. Requirements became much more stringent and there's a greater emphasis on documenting student activities and student learning outcomes. As a result, many of the programs going up for accreditation under the 2009 standards are receiving provisional accreditations for two years and being asked to provide additional documentation that may not have been collected by the institution previously. The Common Core Curriculum, which graduates of a KCREP program no matter where that program is located, we'll take coursework in. 
It includes professional identity. For students in the Clinical Mental Health Counseling Program, this course serves that purpose. Social and cultural diversity. Human growth and development. Career development. Helping relationships. Group work. Assessment and research and program evaluation. Should you look at your program of study, you'll note that a course in each of these areas is a required course for you to take. In addition, specialized training areas also are accredited. These are the unique counseling fields in which training could be received. Specialized areas accredited by KCREP include career counseling, college counseling, community counseling, gerontological counseling, marital, family, and couple counseling, mental health counseling, school counseling, student affairs, and counselor education and supervision at the doctorate level. You'll notice an asterisk placed besides community counseling and mental health counseling. In the past, these had been two separate and distinct counseling tracks. However, beginning with the 2009 standards, they had been collapsed and combined into one singular clinical mental health counseling track. While there will be one going forward, there are some programs who were accredited before the 2009 standards came into existence that still may offer a community counseling track. And then finally the field-based training activities. Graduates of KCREP accredited programs are required to complete practicum and internship experiences. The practicum is a 100 clock hour experience at least 40 of those hours must be spent in direct service to clients. In addition, one hour per week of supervision is required. The internship hour, which is used as the more advanced field-based experience, requires 600 clock hours, 240 of which are direct service to clients. The expectation now is that students will receive two and a half hours of supervision per week. A review of the proposed changes for the 2016 standards show that there is interest in increasing the internship to 900 hours, particularly for clinical mental health counseling individuals. Given the variety and scope of practice opportunities, greater internship experience will help expose students to these different areas in which they may consider employment in the future. Once you've completed your training and graduated with your degree, you could begin exploring licensure or certification options. There are three basic levels of credentialing that counselors can adhere to. The first is registration. This is the simplest and most basic form of credentialing. Under the registration, 
individuals simply file their contact information with a government agency, alerting the agency that they intend to begin practicing working in that field. With registration, there's no follow-up to make sure individuals working in that field are adequately trained or professionally prepared to provide the services. Taking it one step further, we have certification. Certification allows for state granted title protection to qualified trained persons. Certification is recognition that you have met minimal competency standards and have achieved a certain degree of education that would allow you to competently practice as a counselor. In Mississippi, counselors working for community mental health agencies can receive their state certification through the Department of Mental Health to allow them to work in these settings. At the national level, counselors could become nationally certified counselors by the National Board for Certified Counselors, or NBCC. And then finally, licensure, which is the most stringent form of credentialing. Licensure makes it illegal to practice without meeting state-imposed standards. In Mississippi, you cannot practice as a counselor and call yourself a counselor without having first met all the criteria for licensure and been approved for licensure. Of these three, certification and licensure will be the two that you most commonly interact with in your professional careers. In terms of certification, NBCC is the primary certification you seek. Counselors who are certified by NBCC become Nationally Certified Counselors, or NCCs. This is completely a voluntary recognition. It is not required for you to practice, but it is a statement of your professional standards and quality of your training. To become an NCC, Applicants must pass the NCE exam. This is the national certification exam that NBCC administers. As a side note, NBCC also publishes the CPE, the Counselor Prep Exam, which is used as your comprehensive exam at the end of your master's program. Once certification is achieved, counselors are certified for a period of five years, and they're eligible to renew their certification by documenting achieved continuing education credits. For NBCC, a total of 100 hours of continuing education credits are needed. This comes out to about 20 credit hours per year. There currently are over 52,500 nationally certified counselors in America. Now thinking back to how many counselors we referenced earlier, 600,000, approximately 9 to 10 percent are certified. So certification certainly is a level that takes you above many others practicing in the field. 
In addition to the NCC, other certifications are available. Specialty area certifications can be sought as well. These include the Certified Clinical Mental Health Counselor, the Nationally Certified School Counselor, the Master Addictions Counselor, or the Approved Clinical Supervisor. All of these are certifications that with appropriate training, education, and experience you can apply for and receive. Licensure, which we've already referenced as being the most stringent form of credentialing, is a state level credential. Individual states license counselors to practice in their jurisdictions. As of 2009, when California enacted a licensure law, all 50 states plus the District of Columbia now have counseling licensure laws on the books. These licensure laws make it illegal to practice without first obtaining a license. Some states have reciprocity agreements that facilitate counselor mobility and portability. In other words, if a counselor is licensed in one state, they may be able to move to another state and have their license carry over. Although ACA and other counseling organizations are working very strongly at the moment to develop a counselor licensure parity or portability law which would allow someone to be licensed in all 50 states, the current setup requires individuals to meet state requirements for licensure. To practice in Mississippi, you need to meet a different set of standards than you would in Alabama or Louisiana. Licensure came about in the 1970s. It was a way for professions to protect what it is that they did. Without licensure laws, anyone could set up shop and say they were practicing as a counselor. Without licensure law, there was no way to safeguard the public and guarantee to them that the people that they seek treatment from would all adhere to a similar ethical code or have similar types of training. To prevent just anyone from claiming to be a counselor, licensure was sought. And in 1976, Virginia became the first state to adopt a licensure law. Although the requirements vary by state, there are some common characteristics or required documentation that they all look for. Individuals must show that they graduated from an approved program of study. The number of hours will vary from state to state, whether it's 48 or 60. Individuals must document that they participated in field experiences, practicums, and internships. They must show that they have successfully passed the NCE exam. The NCE exam, in addition to certification purposes, is used by many states as the licensure exam. Some states require additional testing requirements such as the Nationally Certified Mental Health Counselor Exam 
or a state level exam developed by that state. States also require the accumulation of clinical experiences after your master's degree. Counselors must document that they've worked in the field from a period of 1,500 hours to 4,500 hours, depending on the state in which they seek licensure. And all require continuing education whether the license is renewed on a yearly basis or a biannual basis continuing education is required to show that you are current in your skills and practice and the third area we talk about in professional development is professional development Getting involved in professional organizations is a great way to increase your professional identity and to strengthen your affiliation with counseling. There are many different organizations you could join. The American Counseling Association is the largest national organization for professional counselors. There currently are over 53,500 members of ACA. This past year, ACA recently reached its high water mark for membership. They also have had 27 consecutive months of increased membership growth. So clearly, more and more individuals are realizing the benefits of joining professional organizations such as ACA. A review of ACA's website will show that there are many benefits of membership in addition to continuing education opportunities, networking opportunities, advanced training opportunities, discounts on counseling liability insurance, conferences, books and training materials, Each year, ACA hosts an annual convention in which counselors could attend and gain continuing education credits. Between 3,500 and 4,500 counselors each year attend the annual convention. Held every year in March, this past year the conference was held in Cincinnati, and in 2014 it will be held in Honolulu. In addition to ACA, there are many divisions that are housed under the ACA umbrella. These organizations work in specific counseling areas. They're divided up really into two different classes. There are passion divisions and workplace divisions. Among the workplace divisions, Individuals could work in the school counseling division, the mental health counselors division, the vocational rehabilitation division. Among the passion divisions, individuals could participate in groups that have similar like interests, creativity in counseling, assessment, social justice, there currently are 20 divisions in ACA. The 20th recently received division status in March of 2013. This group was the Association for Child and Adolescent Counseling. ACA also has regions you can participate in a region and network with others from your geographic area. ACA is currently divided into four regions, the Midwest, North Atlantic, Southern, and Western region.
Opportunities to engage in the profession at the state level are also available. The Mississippi Counseling Association is a strong and active state organization. Over 1,000 members of MCA participate in many of the different activities sponsored by the association. MCA has several ACA division affiliates. So if you're interested in multicultural work, counselor education or supervision, assessment, career or schools, there are state branches of those divisions as well. Like ACA, there's an annual conference each year in November that counselors could attend and gain further training and continuing education. On our Blackboard page, you'll find links to the membership applications for both MCA and ACA. I strongly encourage you to consider joining these organizations. In addition to the many benefits they provide you, and the substantial role they play in developing your professional identity, doing so at this time will allow you to take advantage of tremendous discounts as students are able to join at significantly reduced rates. So how can you get involved in your profession? Aside from joining these organizations, you need to actively participate just having a membership certificate does not allow you to develop as a professional counselor. You should attend conferences and professional meetings. Check and see where conferences are being held. If they're local, within driving distance, or available to you, make a plan to attend. You could serve on national, regional, or state level committees. Have a voice, play a role in advancing the counseling profession. You could also run for office in a professional group or division. Leadership opportunities are plenty for those individuals looking to advance. You could also submit manuscripts or articles or pro propose to present at conferences. Rather than being simply a consumer of research, consider producing and sharing with others what you've learned or what you have researched. Allowing others to benefit from your findings or experiences helps us grow as a profession. And finally, you could promote excellence. Organizations such as Chi Sigma Iota, which is the National Honor Society for Counseling, can help demonstrate that you're committed to excellence in your field or craft. Established in 1985 by Dr. Tom Sweeney at the University of Ohio, there are currently over 286 active chapters at colleges and universities nationwide, and over 90,000 individuals have been initiated in the nearly 30 years CSI has been in existence. To be inducted into Chi Sigma Iota, you need to maintain an academic record of achievement by maintaining a GPA of 3.5 or higher in your graduate counseling work, and you must have the recommendation of your counseling faculty. membership has its privileges. There are networking and leadership opportunities, stipends and funding for research, travel and professional involvement, scholarships for continued education. A review of the Chi Sigma Iota website will show you all that membership has to offer. 
our campus and our program has an active Chi Sigma Iota chapter, the Phi Upsilon chapter. After being enrolled for a minimum of nine hours in the program, should you meet academic standards and criteria for admission, you may be extended an invite to join. I would encourage you to give strong consideration to joining as this is another sign that you are engaged in the profession and clearly trying to promote counseling as a strong profession. So as you're beginning your careers keep in mind that becoming a professional counselor means adopting an identity of a counselor and that identity needs to be strengthened through our training our credentialing and our professional involvement and it does not end with our graduate training program it's a lifelong career-long process that we should continually be involved with.